Kai was the person who's credited to build the first fish pond in the world. He built it in Hana, Maui. He made the fish pond there and the people of the other Ahupuas of the neighboring side all wanted similar things, so they would ask him to help them with fish ponds on Maui. And by then, his family was growing. His son, Ai Ai, became a strong man, and he started to head some of the parties going out to the fish pond. Then from Maui, he went to Molokai. From Molokai, he see Oahu, and he came to and landed in Waimanalo. In Waimanalo, he built the first fish pond on Oahu. Legend is, wherever he went and built fish ponds, people would ask him, how can we show our appreciation? And I, I said, nothing for myself, but if you will, put up a stone to honor my father, Kuakai, put it up on the eastern side of your fish pond, and maybe on the other side, put up a stone for my mother, Hina. The Kula stone is something you would find at traditional Hawaiian fish ponds. The one we found at Kanewai was actually covered in brush and buried over. So as we started clearing, we came across this upright stone right at the edge of the fish pond. And that's the male stone. And normally there's a Hina stone on the other side of the fish pond. So you have this balance. You'll see surviving stones at, at Hawaiian fish ponds still today. There were almost 500 fish ponds that were identified all throughout the islands. So kind of just to think about how common they were and what a normal thing it would have been to see a fish pond walking along the shoreline in the area where you lived. They're such an integrated part of the watershed and the ahupua'a because the real common ones along our coastlines combine the importance of the marine environment and then also the water coming down from the mountains. They're a reflection of everything that comes down through the watershed, but also the health of the fisheries around them. If you think about it historically too, because they required so much manpower to build the actual infrastructure. In that way, it reflected the unity of the people living in the area, but also like the quality of leadership for an ali'i or a konohiki of the area to be able to galvanize a large amount of people over whatever amount of time that it would take to move, especially the ponds that required the heavy rocks from the mountains. How do we get protein on Oahu? The old folks said, let's eat fish. And why do we make so many fish ponds? It's because we're feeding people. According to scientists, Hawaiian fish ponds, when they were working properly, could produce between 300 and 500 pounds of fish per acre per year. There were, as of 1880, 114 fish ponds comprised of about 3,600 acres of freshwater pond, making a million pounds of fish a year on Oahu. And those 114 ponds actually are more than all the other fish ponds and the rest of the Hawaiian Islands. So Oahu had so much fresh water bubbling out of the ground. And what the ancestors did, if they saw it on the land, they'd make a pond. But if they saw it in the ocean, they'd also build a wall to keep that fresh water inside. Hawaiians see that the fish are congregating to the fresh water, and then they would make a, a fish pond at that area. So they specifically cited the fish ponds and areas where there were freshwater springs. All the springs that were in this area had fish ponds. So even though many of them have been filled in, we could see that there had to be some connection. The reason they put fish ponds at springs was because the springs would keep the parasites off the fish and it keeps the fish pond healthy by circulating the fresh water. And then you can grow your limu. The green strand limu is, is what the mullet eat in the fish pond. So they're not fed, they actually have to feed on that limu. From there, herbivores are encouraged to come into the fish pond as young juvenile pua. And then as they grow up, they're harvested. So that's a self-containing system. They're never fed like Western aquaculture relies on feeding constantly. The other difference, Hawaiians have predators in the ponds and Kaku or the barracuda will it'll remove those sick fish from the population. So you always have this healthy, self-sustaining fish pond. 
The fish ponds were designed specifically so that the juvenile fish can be raised in harmony with the ocean. And to farm the ocean, you have to know the ocean and have a deep knowledge, which today we're just scratching the surface on that. Hawaiians observed you know, over centuries and centuries and they knew when the spawning periods would occur. So in this area, we have the Naiholo, which they originated in Pearl Harbor or Pu'uloa. And then they would travel around the island all the way to Kahuku. And Kahuku was the end point. So Mauna Lua, where we are today, is one of the places that the Anai Holo would come. And they were attracted by the fresh water. Kupuna talk about they could smell that fresh water. Before they would enter Mauna Lua Bay, they were way outside and this massive school is coming. And you could, as far as you can see, you see mullet. Here we are at Kalawai Beach, which is at the base of Diamond Head Crater. The traditional story about the Anai Holo is that they started off in Pearl Harbor. But back a hundred years ago, Pearl Harbor was known as Kiava o Pu'uloa. And the mullet actually came out of West Lock, which is one of the three locks in Pearl Harbor. And they specifically came from a spot that was called Kaihu o Palaai. And that simply means the nose of a person named Palaai. The Anai Holo are actually pelagic spawners. That means that they, they don't spawn in the harbors and the estuaries, the streams, the canals, where you usually find them. But when it's time to spawn, which is in the winter and spring months, usually from about November through January or so, the Anai Holo come together in, in huge schools, or they did previously anyway, they would just start swimming out into the open ocean. And that's where they would spawn. They'd spawn in the open ocean. That's why they're called pelagic spawners. The three stages of growth for the mullet were pua, the baby mullet, ama ama, which were the juvenile mullet up to about 12 inches long, and then the mature mullet, which were anai, they were between 12 to 24 inches long. When the mature mullet, the Anai, got together to school when it was time for them to do their pelagic spawning, as soon as they left the bay or the harbor where they normally live, they became Anai Holo, the traveling mullet. They would start in Pearl Harbor, they would start in Kiavo Pulo, and make a turn to the east, and they would pass all of the shoreline spots and then come up around Diamond Head and come through this area where we are right now, which is Ka'alawai Beach. My family home was here for 40 years and all of the surf spots between Black Point and the lighthouse, my friends and I, we surfed every single one of them. We'd be out here surfing during the, during the winter months, especially in December, and the schools of Anai Holo would just come flying past us they were in the thousands and it always amazed us. They weren't just cruising or just parking like a school of fish like Becky or some of the other schooling fish, but they were on the move and they just come flying through the surf, going under us, around us, and sometimes even over our boards. And they'd be heading up towards Mauna Lua, up towards Cocoa Head and Cocoa Crater. When they would come to Mauna Lua, they're they're outside in the ocean and the Hawaiians in this area, they're waiting for them. Papalukela was the konohiki out in the, in the bay. And you can imagine when this big, huge school showed up, it was a lot of excitement. That's what they've been waiting for. And Papalukela would be waiting at the makaha and he would lift up the gates. And you would think that all the fish in the fish pond would escape, but that's not what happened. Instead, the big school from outside would swim against the current into the fish pond because they can smell that fresh water. So Hawaiians designed these systems so that all that fresh water would attract the fish to the fish pond. So 1880, we've got 114 fish ponds. There might have been more than that. But these are the big ones. They're in Ko'olau. They're in Kona, all of Waikiki used to have fish ponds, all the way through Kaka'ako, where Ward is, all those areas. 
What happened to those ponds? Why did they disappear? Ben Dillingham. So Ben Dillingham decided he wanted to pull a, a railroad all the way around the island. And then it's kind of irritating to have a railroad tracks where there's water, so he filled in the pond. And then there's the idea about how Waikiki was full of mosquitoes because of the taro patches in the fish ponds and all that standing water. But that's a fallacy. Taro can't grow in standing water. It has to be flowing very quickly. It has to be cold. Fish ponds cannot function without circulation. So the water has to be cold and completely bubbling out of the ground. Somebody decided that Waikiki should be a tourist destination. They forced the taro farmers and the fish pond keepers to fill in their taro patches and fish pond, and they had to pay for it. And if they couldn't afford to pay for the fill, then the land was confiscated, and they had nothing. And that wasn't enough for Waikiki. Then they went through Honolulu District. When we come down towards Honolulu Harbor, when we go towards Sand Island today, fish ponds, fish ponds, and fish ponds. And I think part of it was not only Ben Dillingham's railroad, but there was an idea that things that were Hawaiian, like taro patches, like eating taro, like fish ponds, like eating fish, this was all really caveman stuff. I think that every aspect of, of our land base is important to acknowledge because the overtaking of our kingdom back in 1893, from that period come forward to us becoming a state in 1959. I think there's a lag in history, you know, and from that, from that period and our people feeling the crunch of, wow, we no longer have our land base, you know, and those that that really carried on working the taro patches because they knew the taro was important, that poi had to be made, and fishing kept going on because the fish was the way of balancing our diet. And then when all of that was all exploited, you know, there was a period, it's like a lull in period of time that had to be put, brought back. In order for people to understand that the culture is still here and alive and the people are still here. We have to show that a lot of the things which sometimes looks old is still alive. The heiaos are still alive. The fish ponds are still alive. It's all alive. So my part in all of this is I'll help participate by teaching others. We were taught just be quiet and watch. I understood that a lot of times people learn not by just watching and being quiet, but you have to show them the basics of what I'm doing when I'm doing it. So you set the papaku a certain way and it's not going to fall. There are different parts of a wall. First is our pohaku niho. So pohaku niho are the foundational stones, but when we translate it, um, pohaku is rock, niho is our teeth. And so like our teeth is rooted in our gums, we do root the pohaku niho into the sand or dirt or ground wherever you're building. And on top of that is our alo. Every pohaku or every rock has a face, yeah? So we look for the face and it's supported by our panihaka haka, yeah? And those are smaller rocks. Uh, in our case, we use smaller, rounder rocks that we wouldn't use as a face. In other fish ponds, a lot of people use haka haka as coral. Um, but because we have a lot of wave action, we use stone because the waves will just break down the coral and move it around too much. And to cap all of that off is the papale, our capstones. So papale is like a hat. And so when we cap the wall, then it's pa'a. When you leave it open, then it's open to the elements to knock it down. So it's very key that all these things line up together. Um, and always remember too that no matter how big or small the rock, it all has a function. So we do have alaka'i that we have out on the wall. And so that's to just ensure that one, we're building correctly and that it'll be functional. And then two, that we hit our goal, whether it's in footage or height, and to keep our wall straight. Yeah, our kupuna are very, very meticulous and they're very mayo and ma'e ma'e, very neat and clean. We try to be the same way.
being able to pass Pohaku from one generation to another generation, to stand in the same line um, and then step away later and see the wall, a big chunk of the wall completed. It's a sharing and experience. It's a sharing of Ike while we pass and talk story with each other. Keiki are learning from Makua or Kupuna are learning from Keiki and all this connections going on. And so to be able to just have time to pass rock from one generation to another generation and make it pa'a in the wall is a really beautiful experience. One of the things about the fish ponds is that they were constructed to work with the ocean so that the ocean will circulate the fish pond. And the old fish pond keepers, a lot of times they would sleep during the day, especially in this area, Wailupe fish pond, for example, the Nakano family over there. They learned from the Hawaiians how to manage the fish pond and that included managing the makaha. So that's where the pond breathes and during certain moons, they lift up the gates and that allows certain fish to come in and then they're trapped. So it it's all revolves around the tides and then the time of year is also equally important. Each of the fish ponds had a mo'o and usually the mo'o was the guardian of the pond. If you defiled the pond in any way, that would upset the Mo'o. They say the Mo'o family came from Tahiti and there's families today that trace their genealogy to the Mo'o lines. I always felt that Kahana was very, very special. The fish pond was really the bread basket, you know, of that Ahupua'a. And so when they, they readily needed fish, they would just go get it. It was not for the Maka'ainana. I believe it was for our elite class. So I believe that every fish pond that is in place today has something to do with our ali'i of that time. Annie Ka'ohokalole owned this whole valley, 5,280 acres thereabout. And she eventually sold this aina. I always felt that because she was Queen Lili'okalani's mama, King Kalakawa's mama, that, you know, we in Kahana, we gotta be special. Our fish pond is located at the river mouth of Kahawai Nui, uh, but is also spring fed by uh, springs that are in the inner part of the fish pond, closer to the mountainside. So according to some of the studies that have been done at Hui Lua, they placed it to be around 600 years old and built by Menehune. It's about a thousand feet long. The wall itself encompasses at least seven acres of water and aina. Although we know Menehune built it, it also takes communities to maintain it. The pohaku there did not come from kai, it's all basalt, so it came from aina. So it probably came from different away or ditches alongside the valley and had to be carried and transported down there. And all those hands that maintained and created the pond that we're trying to restore it so we too can also malama that mana that is there. So the state owns Kahana Valley, over 5,200 acres of aina or land um, from our highest mountain peak at Pu'upawao all the way to the Bay Area, which is called Kalehualoa. My grandmother grew up in Kahana Valley with her parents, Daniel Francis Bernie and Mary Hart Kava'aho. I grew up here most of my life. Kahana has always been my foundation, my kahua. I can go travel around the world, but when I come home, I know home and it'll bring me back to focus on the things I need to work on and focus on the things that I need to do so I can uh, more effectively complete and carry out the responsibilities I have. Historically, the fish pond here was given as the local ia and it was given to Waiaha. And Waiaha was the wahine that lived in this area. This whole Kuleo'o land parcel was, was given to her. So that's some of the earliest written documentation that we have of this fish pond right here. Fish ponds are designed to breathe. And if you don't have a functioning system where the pond can breathe, you get a stagnant and unhealthy pond. And that's what we had here at Kanewai. So we, when we first arrived, it was choked with invasive vegetation, trees, where the awai lets the water out, it was cemented closed. 
and the water was black and there were some tilapia and mosquito fish. As far as native species, there were next to none. So as we removed the invasive vegetation, we could see the water clarity starting to change. And as we removed the cement that plugged the Awai, little by little after several years, the water started to flow and now it flows strongly. And at the Awai, there's a gate called the Makaha. And Maka is eye and Ha is breath. That's how the pond breathes. So that was, that was an architectural feature specifically designed to manage the pond. And at Kaniwai Spring, we have different types of construction. So the, the bottom is built on a coral shelf, on an actual coral reef. And then on top of that is the original wall. Later on, you have modern features. So at one point, a waterfall was put into the spring. The modern wall that was built in the 80s with cement and all of that has caved over while the Hawaiian dry stack wall has stayed intact because every stone it's fit and locked. So they lock into each one. One of the interesting things that we came across and a lot of it is through taking care of the fish pond. We look up and we see we're right below a ridge. And then at the other fish pond that we have been restoring at Kalau Ha'i Ha'i, it's the same thing, it's right below a ridge. That was actually intentionally placed there because the fresh water drains right to the ridge spur. And at that spur, you have your punavai, your spring. And that's your perfect place for your fish pond. Fish don't know the <laughs> boundaries of property and birds don't know boundaries of property. But we artificially think there's separations between um, bodies of water, but really there's not. And right here is the source of fresh water for this whole area. And it comes out of the lava tube, it drains through the aquifer. And once it comes out of here, it flows through the makaha and it feeds into Kanewai fish pond. And from there, the fresh water flows through another makaha and it goes into Paiko Wildlife Sanctuary. And finally, it opens into Maunalua Bay. So from this small punavai or spring, it feeds a tremendous area. And we have some old photos of horses drinking fresh water way out by the reef. And it's coming all the way from inside we're not right on the ocean here, but it actually feeds the ocean. I'm actually the eighth generation of a family that has resided in this area since before Kamehameha arrives. And one of our ancestors, Mikalemi, was Konohiki of Aiea, and during his time was responsible for the Kuahu. He was the caretaker of Pakule, which is at the mouth of Pu'uloa at a place called Kapakule. So fish was in our family for a long time, but not just fish for eat fish, but to care for the fish, to steward the water so that there was abundance. And now we step into that same space without even knowing that that's the role that we would play. This fish pond is called uh, Loko Pa'ayao. It is uh, about 400 years old, built by the native Hawaiians. It's at, located at the group point of Pearl Harbor. Because we're on a military base, uh, access wasn't allowed. And so this presents an opportunity for those who knew about the site, our kapuna, to come out and see the site again and see that we are taking care of it. Not only the kapuna, but also anciently, you know, we are healing the land. It's important because it belongs to the Hawaiians in the first place. Um, the community should benefit from it too. Originally, the king let the Navy borrow this island for a while so they could do training by and shipping things out of here. And later it became more permanent, but still it belongs here to the Hawaiians. It'll benefit the whole community to know what valuable land they have here that served the Navy. And uh, the many of them are not 
knowledgeable of this place. It'll open eyes. We knew there was a fish pond, but we didn't know the wealth of the information that was out there and the historical importance. This is where the queen of Oahu came and made her home and cared for her people. And her name was Kalani Manuia. She lived in a time of peace and it's obviously because she cared for the people and she actually literally built these fish ponds alongside the people, carried stones and helped them. So during her reign, it was peace and prosperity. She is actually the daughter of Kukani Loko and the grandmother of Kakuhi Heva, who we all know as having reigned over Oahu. So very important and sacred site for the whole island. The Navy received funds to clear all the mangrove around Pearl Harbor area, and this included local pa'aya. After they cleaned it, the fish pond wall was present with four makaha, and so we uh, began the preservation of this pond uh, with the Native Hawaiian community. As soon as we came in and cleared the majority of the mature mangrove rainforest, um, we immediately saw the native Hawaiian birds coming back and utilizing this hair area as a foraging habitat. So we found both the native Hawaiian stilt, the black crowned night heron, turnstones, the kalea or the Pacific golden plover, all immediately were found in this area. And, and they are always here um, at this point moving forward. So we are seeing birds returning and utilizing the, in, the habitat in the same way that birds would have used it hundreds of years ago. A foraging habitat is an area that animals use to feed. The water birds are feeding on small worms, fish, crabs, any type of crustacean. And the, as the water exposes the mud, they can come in and feed in that habitat. Mangrove, unfortunately in Hawaii, it was never here. It's not native here and can therefore outcompete all of the native vegetation. It's preventing the native plants from growing here, which then has a ripple effect of preventing some of the birds or bugs or insects that are specifically associated with the, some of those very specific plants. Once we remove it, typically in the soil and the sediment that where the mangrove was growing, there is a seed bank of native Hawaiian plants and quite literally can be there for decades waiting for the right conditions for the seeds to germinate and regrow. So typically when you go in and remove the mangrove, you want to kind of keep that, maintain it, and watch for a little while and see what naturally comes out of the seed bank. It, it is a quite long and labor intensive process, but it needs to be done. As an archeologist, it's my responsibility to make sure that we are protecting and preserving native Hawaiian sites, including this fish pond here at Magoo Point. And with the Navy, it's my responsibility to consult with the native Hawaiians and also to protect the sites for future generations. Well, we're in the southern end of Kaneohe Bay, and Waikalua Loko is situated between Kava Stream and Kaneohe Stream, where it empties out into the southern part of Kaneohe Bay. So the upa of Kaneohe extends from the top of the Koala Mountain Range, and in, in this particular place, the highest peak in Kaneohe is known as Keahi Akahoi, and it extends all the way down to the furthest edge of the reef beyond Mokapu Hill, on uh, what, what we know now as the Kani Marine Base and Pu'u Hawaiiloa. In the days of old, Ikavakahiko, all of the resources that you needed to survive were within your ahupua'a. In 2013, we were able to acquire Waikulu Loko. It is under the Pacific American Foundation Hawaii Inc., which is a separate nonprofit that we formed just for the purpose of being able to uh, own the asset. It is one of the very first ancient Hawaiian fish ponds to come back into Hawaiian hands since the Great Mahele in 1848. And that's why I feel so passionate about it and that it has deepened my understanding of the kuleana that we have going forward. Uh, I'm thankful to the Kaneohe community and all of the people that have come to help us over the last 25 years that number now over 100,000 students and families and community members that have come to help us with, with practically no money. The elder component to the restoration of the pond is absolutely critical to the continuity of knowledge. With Uncle Fred Takabayachi, he's one of the few that we know that actually grew up on the pond. I was born in 1927, uh, graduated from Benjamin Parker School in 1945. 
I was born and raised on the fish pond. I was there till I was about 10 years old. People who lived here, they were the Nagamatsus, and they lived and they operated a fish pond, and uh, they ran the fish pond. We would see, depending on the tide coming in, the makaha, we would see mullet and ava. We would always want to see what, how the makaha was doing. If the water was swift, then we would see mullet, and there would be mullet like wall to wall and five or six deep. My memories of the Huilo fish pond in Kahana was with my dad. Basically, my dad was an environmentalist. My first memories was going down there and cleaning up the place, trying to get in there and malama, uh, malama the area. They already had a fish pond caretaker out there, but we still went, you know, not only in the fish pond, but the entire coastline, the beaches down in uh, Kahana. I remember the last caretaker as Joe Kekona. Prior to Uncle Joe Kekona being out there, Sam Hill was the uh, fish pond caretaker that I remember. Uh, pretty much an extraordinary person because he was not only a sheriff down this side, you know, and the caretaker for the fish pond, but he was our konahiki out here too. So, you know, he was the overseer of the fishing practices in Kahana. There were many, many legends that were shared with us about the fish pond when they said that, the, you know, it was kapu and you could not go fishing and take any of the mullet out of the fish pond. There was a reason for it. And when people broke that kapu, mullet or the fish would all disappear. And people didn't know why. When I look back at our days, you know, being raised in Kahana, and I think how blessed and how fortunate we were, even though we had to walk. There was no school bus. We had to walk to Kaava school from Kahana. And then we walked home from Kaava to Kahana, you know. I said, by God, there was no such thing as going to 7-Eleven. If we wanted peanuts, we went on the beach and pounded kamani, you know, and the kamani nuts were, were our snacks, you know, and there's a lot of guavas. And so we had a lot of guavas. I talk about husking a coconut, you know, if we were thirsty, no such thing as getting soda water. I mean, it was busting the coconut. <laughs> Busting the coconut and husking it right on the roadway and drinking the coconut water. Kilo in English is observation or observing. For some of the keiki, this environment is not one that they see often. So getting them kind of away from the classroom setting, away from the technology setting, and letting them explore outside really made them excited. Oh, you see? Oh, yeah. yeah. The kids learn that they have five senses, yeah, our po, our maka, our ihu, our waha, our pepe, our lima. And we also know that our, from our kupuna, we also have that sixth sense, or our na'o. Our kupuna were great kilo. Kilo is very scientific. I mean, you can kilo the, the constellations, the stars, and astronomy, that's science. Yeah, you can kilo the ocean, the waves, the weather. This is all science. Our kupuna, they're like the best scientists ever, yeah? Very um, keen to, to their world around them and how it affected them. Um, and through observation, practices were born, yeah? So we see that through observation, practical things become daily life. Our ancestors may have not understood the term photosynthesis, but they absolutely knew the causal relationship between the sun, the moon, the tides, uh, and how that impacted uh, the propagation of fish in the context of a local ia. They were able to understand the interrelationships and their interdependency between Malka and Makai and the ocean. And to be able to create a situation where they didn't have to be hunters and gatherers anymore. They understood the power of being able to actually farm fish, herbivores in a way that could sustain itself for hundreds of years. Can you imagine that? We're only beginning to understand all of the intricacies of how all of that work as we begin to try to restore some of these ponds. One Hawaiian proverb that comes to my mind when we were doing the kilo was li'u uh, ikapa'akai, um, which kind of means to preserve the ike of our kupuna because a lot of the knowledge that we are seeking 
our kupuna already found and they already know. So being able to come out here and kilo and do what our kupuna did, we can find knowledge and the answers. Well, we really engage with Waikoko Loco as this fantastic space of multiple lenses, where I can be in this space and be thinking from a science lens, from a historic lens, from a mathematics lens, from the lens of a cultural practitioner. I can start to explore the brilliance of indigenous and ancestral knowledge that builds the foundational base that allows for the structure of an ahupua, a system, and a, a population that is roughly the same of what we have now in Hawaii, but could fully sustain themselves. No shipping 90% of your foods in. So now we start to dig at those, those deeper kinds of questions. And I really try to open it up more to the, the teachers that I bring or the educators that I bring here, to have them start to investigate, how does this become the classroom space? How do we start to see this one place as the example of the wealth of knowledge that all of our communities provide? I think the revitalization of ponds is kind of like a part of a, a whole interconnected movement that's happening, um, not just here in Hawaii, but all around the world, you know, people becoming more connected to their places and wanting to be more involved with those places. And I think just like a remembering of how reliant we are on the places where we live both physically for physical sustenance and health, but also like for our mental and spiritual and emotional health too. Hui Lua has been a place where recently we've had a push in really restoring that space. It's been a really big period of growth for us in seeing that we're all trying to learn, yeah? Um, and so we always take the cue from Hui Lua. Hui means to join, Lua means to, so to join two things together. And for us, when we think about that and we makavalu or we see that name in all perspectives, it's the joining of things, yeah? So the joining of people to make this wall, the joining of people and hands together with everyone's effort. At Kaniwai Spring, it was a long effort to actually get the ownership. We didn't start out owning the spring. For the community to actually get ownership, we started by approaching the former owners and saying, if we can have access for our community, can we malama the spring? And that's how things started. And a lot of the effort, it wasn't some big organization. It was very grassroots. It was a long time families from this area. As community rallied around to save the spring and also to malama the spring, then you could see the reflection change and the spring water came clear. I lived in this neighborhood for seven years and I didn't have the slightest idea that this fish pond existed. Hundreds of school children and local community people have been here over the past few years working on uh, cleanup days. And uh, I'm very excited in the time that I'm gonna have here to see it develop and to see if we can actually turn it back into a working fish pond. We are very excited at the opportunity to work with local IAEA community organizations, the Hawaiian civic clubs, local schools, and other community members to develop and help enrich this aspect of the Hawaiian heritage and culture. My goal for this project is to heal relationships, not only with Department of Defense and Native Hawaiians, but with the community as a whole, because that's the only way we can move forward as a society. It's awesome. I mean, I've seen them work real hard removing the mangrove trees. That's a huge job. But to see actually the pond itself, it's like magic. It's powerful, the relationships that are created here, the friends that you make, who you just started by bending down in the pond and pulling mangrove. And next thing you know, you're feeding each other and sharing time with each other and loving each other. And that's one of the outcomes. That's not going to be in a plan that is written. That comes from each of us coming with open heart, pure heart. And um, it's a beautiful space for that. We talk about kia'i loko'i'a, and the kia'i is someone who takes care of a space. So when we think about kia'i loko'i'a, or fish pond caretaker, um, we're very blessed that 
the Pohaku Nihor, the foundation stones that were there are still remain. We still have knowledge from Kupuna that used to work there and their knowledge is from Kupuna before them. So it's a building on of knowledge that Kupu Ana, yeah, like our Kupuna, they Kupu things. Um, and it's that give and take of Mo'olelo um, experiences and stories that continue at Hui Lua. When I think of the role of Kia Ya'i Loko, I think of guardians of tradition, the knowledge of your kupuna. And as the built environment changes, as things get more urbanized, as Hawaii develops, that role becomes all the more important. Um, because once the buildings go up, there is less of a connection to the place. Being a guardian of that knowledge and a caretaker of it is a critical role. Being in Kahana, it's always been a pu'uhonua, yeah, a safe place, a place of refuge for me to come to. And as much kuleana as we do carry here, um, it's somewhere I can never leave. I spent time in this area as a child because my grandmothers lived here and I did not know about Payao or even the name of the Ahupua Kalawao growing up. So discovering that there were places like Payao meant a lot in terms of figuring out what my role is in the Moku of Eva as a community member in Kalawao. And there's not a lot of spaces or kipuka where um, you can connect with kupuna. So learning about payao and becoming more active um, has provided the space to um, listen to kupuna and my ancestors. I grew up in the Kaniwe Ahupua'a and I never knew that this pond existed until I was 40 years old. For me personally to understand what the pond meant to the Ahupua'a and having a higher sense of place and understanding of belonging. We hear all the time the phrase makahana kaike, in the work there is the knowledge. And this is so key over here um, that this is actually our classroom. This is a place where young people, and even people like myself, I'm 56 years old learning about what was over here as we do the work, right? And that intergenerational impact is so valuable. We don't have enough opportunities for our young people to learn from kupuna, from kupuna to learn from young people, and for all of us to learn from the land, which is really the ultimate teacher, is this payao is the one teaching us who we are, why we're here, and where we're gonna be. What we have to do in this generation is to be able to nurture minds and to be able to educate and allow opportunities for us to build bridges and connect the dots between traditional wisdom and ecological knowledge with contemporary uh, science and technology so that we can begin to hopefully in the, not in maybe in my lifetime, but in the, in the next generation and the next generation, be able to actually propagate fish uh, restore the bay, uh, restore the limu, and restore the ecosystem. We have trained teachers from all over the islands and, and even beyond our state. We are always mindful about our pico and about our immediate kuleana to the schools and the children that live in this area because the expectations for our students are going to be far beyond what our life experiences are or have been up to this point. And the more opportunities that we can give them to be able to be those critical thinkers, work well together and help solve problems, starting from their own communities, we're all gonna be better off. We are gonna be better as a community, as a people, and as a state and as a planet. I got involved with this program because I was looking for a way to educate my keiki while giving them an opportunity to work with their community and build a sense of place. And, and I wanted them to feel like they were significant in their land that they, they come from. This fish pond isn't a working fish pond yet, but it is working our minds. And, and that's just as beneficial, where we can come back 
and pull it together and make sure, you know, that we're all collaborating so that one day this fish pond is something that is going to be a working fish pond. And, and it's everyone's collaboration that helped make it so successful. Here in Hawaii, our ancestors really had a great idea about how you increase food production. We need to malama aina in every section. Again, what did ancestors know and how can we use that information? I think it's a great time for us to see how we're going to survive and thrive. Today, we have many of our Hawaiians that are educating themselves, not, not only in and fish ponds and who's the caretakers of the fish pond and getting involved and in trying to bring all that back because that is a sense of place for all of us as Hawaiians. Fish pond plays a very important role in all the ahupua'as. It's just as important in us as us getting to the land and planting our taro. Times are different today than they were 500 years ago. At one time, there were 25 or so fish ponds that lined Pu'uloa. And so you can imagine the great abundance that was readily available to the people. Now there are only three that can be restored fully at this time. So what I envision is that we do that. We do the best we can to rebuild so that the next generation can come forward and do the best they can to rebuild. And down the road, another eight generations, maybe then, will I be eating the fish again? So that's a long-term vision. In the near term, though, it's actually a transformational moment for all of us. We'd like to see this become a healing space. For example, we have a lot of warriors who return from war with really severe illnesses. More and more people are aware that returning to Aina and working with traditional practice can actually have a very strong healing effect too. So we're hoping that in the near future, we'll be able to have practitioners down here, Western and traditional, working together with our soldiers and their families. I'd really like to see Huido Fish Pond become the fish pond it, it was way back there. And I would like to see it back to its uh, original glory, if you will. I want my Kiki to see it. I want my son to be able to come to this fish pond and be able to see this. I want his future kids to see it. And I want this to be something where, you know, you can go back and you're, you're able to say, well, well, my great tutu did, helped and was a part of it. And, and it's not just building a sense of place in yourself, but it's starting that journey through your ohana. And, and it's something so special and so important that that you have to do it, you know, you're not doing it just for yourself, you're doing it for, for your future ohana too. For anyone not being familiar with the Hawaiian culture, when you kind of begin to understand how they were using fish ponds, it's, it's fascinating, it's innovating, and, it, and it's kind of um, inspiring to know that people here figured this out a long time ago, wait, you know, and you bring in all this technology now and they pretty much already had it figured out a long time ago. And what a perfect way to sustain a, a culture and a community by managing these resources. And Hawaiians were, are the only ones that have figured out how to kind of manage the fish resources at the ocean's edge. It's part of our history, like anything else, you know. And I think if you recognize what part it played in the uh, history of Hawaii, you can appreciate it, you can protect it for other kids behind you. Someone said that you don't malama a place unless you have aloha for it. And I think that is so wise. It is absolutely important that, um, again, we incorporate and we be the bridge for this traditional wisdom, which we're still learning about, and at the same time, being creative and innovative with all of the tools that we have today to figure out how we can um, nurture ourselves in a pono way with aloha. People from all over the world now are coming here to be able to understand and experience that because there is value to it. And it is important for us to continue to be able to impart that knowledge and that value with our own people here so that that can continue for the next generations on and on and on.
taking care of the fish ponds is not a job. It's more of a kuleana and a responsibility. And everyone that comes here, they do it because there's this sense of spirituality and, and you can feel the mana as soon as you enter, you're not alone. You can feel all the kupuna here. And they're in everything that happens here. I do feel kupuna at the pond. I feel the presence of Puha Hill. Even today, you know, all of our kupunas that we've lost, sometimes when I'm out on my porch, I can hear them singing. You'll definitely feel the presence of our ancestors. Spirituality is something that I would say has always been here, but has been reawakened with the community coming in. And community comes here, they always come to pay their respects and, and offer a whole kupu to the, the pohaku over here, the kuula stone. And that's just a practice that has always taken place here. Um, you know, before you would go fishing or, or you gather, you would always pay your respects before and, and offer okupu. I think it's kind of the idea that we're not only here for ourselves and we're, we're thinking about the greater community. So that, that's the idea behind it, I think. When I see the oku'u returning and feeding and the I.O. Um, coming back to this area, I see my kupuna coming back. They're blowing around us right now. You can see them in the wind, how the, the water ripples, what comes to greet us. I think they've always been here waiting for us. And kupuna have told me this beautiful uh, proverb that said, the ancestors are waiting at the mouth of the river for the descendants to return. And in this case, the descendants are all of us together with the Navy coming together to restore peace and abundance to this place. You cannot really understand Aloha Aina to be able to love the place and to persevere through all of the challenges to restore and preserve a place like this without really having that spirituality, that power of uh, love uh, that for me only comes from a kua. We always make a circle uh, whenever we start this because it reinforces the idea that collectively, when we share that aloha in that kind of way, that aloha kekahi i kekahi, that there is nothing that we cannot do and that we are actually connected to part of something that is much greater than us. For me personally, that is aloha. From the first kia'i or the first people that decided to build that fish pond, it continued on Maybe we lost a few, not kia'i, but maybe we lost our way a little bit um, or the practice a little bit, but the foundation still remains that when we come back, we can still look at it, build upon it. We still have knowledge from kupuna that used to work there and their knowledge is from kupuna before them. We have documented over 488 of these ponds that were built over 800 years on the eight major Hawaiian islands and we have maybe 10 to 15 percent of them left so they're on the verge of vanishing from the landscape in our lifetime we need to hold on to this because they are a connection to the past and that wisdom is still something that empowers us today and nourishes us today as we move into the 21st century i think it's it's so important for communities to know the value in the land that they're in i'm definitely always amazed by our ancestors at how well they were able to create such such amazing feats in our islands. It really is a breathtaking experience to be in these spaces and to take it all in and and you know you just have to stand here at one point and and you look around you and it's just you really are in a sense of awe where you really are amazed, you feel so proud that you come from a line of people that that just thrived on these islands. The revitalization of the fish ponds that people are doing now is very important. It's recapturing a piece of cultural history that's pretty much been lost over the years. A lot of the fish ponds have been landfilled. They've been destroyed for just various reasons on all of the islands. And to actually 
restock ponds now to rebuild the ponds and restock them is showing us how native Hawaiians use the ponds and they understood completely the cycles of the fish, the marine environment, and exactly how all of this operated. For every one of us, it is our hope that our children and our grandchildren will pick it up and carry it and move forward. You come over here and it's come as, almost like a sacred ground. At least it was held in high esteem by people. And I think we should keep that as much as we can. I feel peaceful when I'm here and gazing out to the water, watching the fish swim by and seeing the different birds. My heart feels awesome. It feels so warm to know that this is here. It'll be here forever. <laughs>